Good afternoon. My name is Dave Austin. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency at UC Santa Barbara, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, very important lecture. Um, this is one of a series of lectures that the Institute uh, provides uh, with the purpose of reaching out to the community, both the UCSB community and also the Santa Barbara community, to stimulate a dialogue about the key issues uh, of importance in our day related to energy and sustainability. And our speaker today is an outstanding example of someone uh, to address those very issues. Um, also very timely, some of you may have noticed that uh, there was a report released just uh, today, the third assessment uh, commissioned by the President Barack Obama on the impact of climate change on the U.S. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I recommend you do. Um, not all 800 pages. I can't say I read the whole, part, uh, the whole document myself, but uh, uh, it, it is a very important document. Uh, the, um, the program today um, will consist of um, a couple of parts in particular. Tom wants this to be, most of all, a discussion. He's going to speak for a period of time, but then it will be followed by an extensive Q&A session. And to facilitate that, we'd like you to write your questions on the cards that were given to you when you came in uh, and pass them along the aisle. Our student ushers will pick them up and bring them to John Bowers, the director of the Institute, who will coordinate the Q&A session with Tom. And if you didn't get a card, please just put your hand up and one of the ushers will, uh, will get you one now. For this event, we're pleased that, uh, to partner with the Carsey Wolf uh, Center, which has generously made available this beautiful Pollock Theater. In addition, we're grateful for the support and assistance of many people who made this event possible. Uh, including Deans Rod Alferness, Pierre Wilsius, the UCSB Office of Institutional Advancement, the Institute staff, and Tom Steyer's team at NextGen. And most of all, to Carsey, Marcy Carsey, who uh, approached Tom and extended our invitation to him to speak. I'd like to now um, introduce Marcy Carsey. Um, who will introduce Tom. Um, it's no coincidence that we're in the Carsey Wolf Center's Pollock Theater and that one of the primary initiatives of the Carsey Wolf Center is environmental media, a topic that's a, a major element of Tom Steyer's action-oriented approach to changing behavior regarding climate change. Marcy is currently the chair of the UC Santa Barbara Foundation Board of Trustees. Now retired, she was a partner with Tom Werner in the Carsey Werner Company, the television production company responsible for The Cosby Show, Rosie Ann, Third Rock from the Sun, The 70s Show, and many others. She was inducted into the Hall of Fame of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and has received numerous awards, including the Emmy, the Peabody Award, the People's Choice Award, the Golden Globe, and many others. She is considered the most successful independent television producer of comedy of all time. Marcy is the parent of two UC Santa Barbara graduates, Becky and John. <coughs> and as I said, we're most grateful for her support and for extending the invitation to Tom. So now I'd like to call on Marcy to come up and introduce our speaker today. You have a bio of Tom in your hands, so I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna tell you much about him. Um, he, you know, was a really he had a really successful career as an investor, investment career. He founded Farallon, and he, he was just, you know, terrific career. He's a smart guy. Now he's using the resources that that he's um, that he's so beautifully gained over his life to do extraordinary things. Extraordinary things. I mean, he believes the biggest problem. I think he believes this um, is um, energy, the biggest thing in need of solutions is energy. And so he has set about um, to solve those problems that, that are energy-based. And um, so he runs NextGen Climate. He, um, <coughs> he has uh, put a, a, a lot of resources and energy and time into, into uh, dealing from an 
an idealistic point of view, but with a pragmatic approach. So God help the politician who's a climate change denier because Tom's coming for you, you know? And there's something about Tom that is like, I think he's interested in energy because he is a human source of energy that I've never, <laughs> I've never seen the likes of. I mean, there's something turbo-like burning inside him that he just, he's unstoppable. So don't ever bet against him. Um, so <laughs> he, um, do read his bio because it's, it's fantastic. And, and he's not, it's not only energy, any problem that he sees that needs a solution, he will find a pragmatic and practical and really effective approach to solving that problem. Um, he, uh, he's created an institution that, um, that, that uh, gives loans to underserved small businesses. He, uh, he's uh, into uh, children's policies uh, that, as that affect energy um, policy. It's just anything Tom touches is going to move. It's, he's going to move the world along. He's going to move society along, and he's going to uh, do it no matter what. So um, he is a force of nature, and I'm privileged and pleased to know him and to, to introduce him to you today, Tom Steyer. So of course that was way too nice. Marcy, thank you very much, but I think you're gonna figure out how over the top that introduction was in about a minute. Um, I am Tom Steyer. Um, really what I hope this will be to a large extent is a chance to talk back and forth and answer questions. But before we get to that, I thought I'd give you a little preamble about why I'm doing what I'm doing and a little bit about how I see the energy problem in the context in the United States and globally. Um, I was, as Marcy said, an investor for 30 years. I, we invested all over the world. We invested in everything. Um, and we primarily invested for endowments and foundations. And at the time I was, you know, absolutely passionate about trying to do it as well as possibly as possible and to do it as straightforwardly as possible. Um, and I went on the board. What really happened was I went on the board of Stanford University. And in thinking about Stanford, I was trying to decide what I could do, what Stanford could do that would be significant, that would really make a difference. And the funny thing is, what I came up, what I thought that needed to happen was for them to lead the way from a technological standpoint in energy. Because I could see that we had this huge problem in terms of climate. And it seemed to me that if, we, if there was a technological fix, that would be the thing that Stanford could do that they weren't doing really and that that could be a way for them to distinguish themselves and have a real impact in the world. And the funny thing is, as I've discovered, a university that really is doing this, has been doing this, and is fantastic at that is UCSB. <laughs> and, but nonetheless, I uh, did my best to push Stanford along, uh, along those lines. And in doing so, I learned a lot about this, the topic. And, what I learned was that norm, you know, as an investor, what you see politically is that in the United States, problems come up. And there is a lot of talk and there's a lot of argument and people, you know, wrangle and yell and then basically come together and come up with a solution that's usually pretty good. And if you look back really to how this has happened in the United States, starting with the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969, people sit there and realize we have a big problem. You know, after the Santa Barbara oil spill, 20 million people come out for Earth Day. After Earth Day, people start to think about what they really need to do. And in a Republican administration, we get the EPA, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act. And in California, we get CEQA and the Coastal Commission. That's the normal American way to do things. We perceive a big problem. We think about it really hard. A lot of people put their voices in, and we come up with solutions. And it's the funny thing that seemed to me to be going on in this case was we have a big problem, and we weren't coming up with solutions. And that's really what I learned in, in 
working through this problem, reading about it, trying to research how to have some impact. So after, after I got involved through Stanford, I got a chance to co-chair a, prop, a no proposition in 2010, which was no on 23, which for those of you who were around in 2010, was basically a defense of California's energy laws, which are the most progressive of any major government in the world. We have more progressive energy laws than Europe. We have more progressive energy laws than really any place in the world. And th there was a prop on the ballot basically to roll them back. And because I was naive, I thought it would be a good thing and I co-chaired it with George Schultz. So one Republican, one Democrat, a chance. And it gave me a chance to really learn how the politics of energy work. Because traditionally in California in propositions, when you had a proposition that pitted business interests against environmentalists, traditionally the business interests, you know, took us to the cleaners. And so what we were trying to do in 2010 was to say we want a completely different way of thinking about this. We want to do a completely different framework. We're going to have different messages, different messengers, and a different coalition. So we basically said we need to have a business voice here. We need to talk about jobs. We need to point out that really any kind of progressive energy policy is going to be good for business. We need to talk about health. We need to talk about what the citizens of California, how their lives and their families are going to be affected. And we need to talk about what this, these companies are trying to do to you. And then we need the messengers to be credible. So when we talked about health, we didn't put me up there. We put the head of the American Lung Association up there. Because when the American Lung Association talks about health, people think they might be telling the truth since that's the only thing they've worried about for the last 40 years. And when you talk about jobs in, in the energy context, you want to have people from business talk about it. Because Californians are smart and they know when business people talk about jobs, they're talking about being able to meet a payroll at the end of the week, having a strategy, knowing what can really happen, they have credibility. And in terms of a coalition, we really didn't want to have the traditional environmental coalition. The traditional environmental coalition in California, and we are a really progressive state, isn't nearly big enough to win here. So we basically want a coalition, the number one group in California and in the United States that believes in the environment, that cares about progressive energy policies, that will vote that way consistently is Latinos. Number two group, Asian Americans. Number three group, African Americans. So when you think about the coalition, when you think about winning elections, it is not the, the traditional coalition that people think of as the environmental coalition is not actually the one that wins. And in 2010, we had a lot of good luck on our side, genuinely. And so a lot of things broke our way, but we won 70-30. And so we felt rightly or wrongly. I mean, George Schultz is the smartest 93-year-old I have ever met. He was also the smartest 92, 91, 90, and 89-year-old. And he said at the beginning, and he was, he's obviously a Republican, he's had four cabinet positions, and he said basically, we need to win, and we need to win in a big way to make our point, that there's something different about what we're going to do. And George is a forceful guy, and he was right. So. He and I also did another one in another, co uh, another proposition in 2012 using a lot of the same tactics in California having to do with closing a tax loophole and using it for environmental retrofits in the schools, which we won 60%, which maybe the trend isn't so good, but the outcome still counts. Um, and then at the end of 2012, I quit my job. And the reason I did that was that I do, what Marcy said is true. I actually think that it's fairly typical in the United States for a generation to have a big challenge. And if you think back through American history over the last 200 years, I, I always joke and say to people, if your family was here in 1873, do you remember where they stood on the big tariff debate of 1873? And of course, no one knows if there was a big tariff debate in 1873, but I promise you in 100 years, no one is going to remember the big budget debate of 2011. That is an, you know, people will yell and scream. It'll be on the front page of every paper in the country, and in, no one will care. 
but there's gen generally one thing that is going to define how our society does. And in my opinion, this is it. Because if we get this right, it, we will do a lot of things. We will innovate, we will change things, and it will be something that we achieve. It won't be something easy, but it'll be something that we definitely can do if we set our minds to it. And the question is, will we set our minds to do it? And when you think back to previous generations, you think back to, in my case, you know, my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, there were things that their generations faced that they remembered forever, and it was how did you perform in that case? And that was the measure of how American society flourished because, you know, they basically saw what the challenges were and, you know, did a great job. And I felt as if, I didn't actually feel like, you know, oh, poor me. I felt like, what a great chance. And that's what I would say to you guys is, what a great chance to see that you can make a difference where we will win this and you can participate in doing something that we will think of as a great accomplishment together. And that's how I felt. I felt like I'd like to be part of that effort. I would like to, you know, do as much as I can at, you know, I'm 56 years old. <coughs> I felt as if that's a great chance to participate in this and to try and full time see whether I can't push this forward faster and I'm, you know, make sure that we win as soon as possible because I think that uh, winning soon is actually really valuable. I'm sure we'll win, but I think winning soon is really valuable. So we've done a bunch of things. We started a business group state by state to push for progressive energy policies because I think, as I said, business voice is absolutely essential. We're doing a study, um, very localized, of the economic impacts in the United States, which is I'm doing with Mike Bloomberg and Hank Paulson. So once again, trying to make it nonpartisan, or in that case, tripartisan, because I think Mike Bloomberg has been a Democrat, a Republican, and an independent. And Hank Paulson is obviously a, a Republican. Um, as a way of taking away the framework that it's either going to be jobs, good jobs, or the environment that somehow there's a trade-off there. Our point th is going to be, and I've seen a preliminary part of the study, th our point is going to be no. Really, we don't have a choice. What is good for the environment is going to be good for the economy. And we've got to get away from the idea that we can't afford to innovate, we can't afford to be creative, we can't afford to do research. We have to go make sure we hang on to the jobs of the 1950s. That is actually not the strategy that is going to work for us. And I you know, I want to be able to quantify that as specifically as possible because when people think about this, they think locally. You know, it, it, people do not care in, on the East Coast particularly about our drought. I mean, they're somewhat aware of it and they're somewhat concerned, but people are very focused locally. So when you do national studies, that's really not that relevant. What's relevant is what you can show is going to happen in St. Louis what's going to happen in Miami, what's going to happen in Fresno. That is actually what people respond to when they start to bring it home and think about what's going to happen to them and their family. Um, so the other thing that we're doing that's probably taking most of my time is we have a political effort. And the reason for that is I basically tried to figure out why we're not you know, winning in this, why the normal American system that wor has worked so well for 200 years really isn't happening here. And you know, I think there's been a lot of talk about whether there's scientific, you know, really we need to figure out if this is happening and why. And I honestly think that that is like the smoking controversy. We're not sure if nicotine is addictive and we're not sure if cigarettes cause cancer. There's a huge disinformation campaign on this, a couple hundred million bucks a year. But it's, you know, that is something that I, I honestly consider is pretty much settled. And it's also not a policy issue. You know, the United States has done a pretty good job, almost exclusively in a Republican administrations, by the way, of solving acid rain, hole in the ozone layer, 
and all of the other pollution problems. Pollution from a policy standpoint is not something that we've never dealt with successfully. It's not something that the people at UCSB could not figure out from a policy standpoint. They'd argue about the best way to do it. But the fact of the matter is when we've put those policies in, American business and American science have responded faster, better, cheaper than anyone ever expected. And if you go back and look in the 1980s, when we put in these policies, everyone would forecast how long it would take, how much it would cost, and all the other stuff, and it was always faster. The innovations were always better than anyone ever expected, and they were what people didn't expect. So when we think about this, one of the things that I find ironic in this energy question is why the people who are supposedly representing American business do not trust American business enough to solve this problem, to innovate our way out of it, and really to come up with a whole bunch of research-based creative solutions that no one has thought of. That is the history of what we do. That's actually our competitive advantage. When you look around the world, that's what we do well, and I don't understand why the Wall Street Journal, which is a great newspaper and is the mouthpiece of American business, does not trust American business to solve these problems. It's actually ironic to me, and I honestly don't understand it. Um, when we talk about things working well, this is actually a place where things are working really well, partly because it's in California, partly because it is almost the birthplace of, the re of modern American environmentalism because of the oil spill, and partially because the UC system is actually really progressive on energy. You know, Janet Napolitano wants the whole UC system to be carbon neutral by 2025. We are actually, as a model of what we're trying to do from a research standpoint and from a behavioral standpoint, this campus, the UC system, Santa Barbara, California, actually is about as good as it gets. When you think about what environmental leadership and energy leadership looks like, it looks a lot like this campus in this town. So I actually think that is both something to be proud of, but it is also something to be confident about. Because the fact of the matter is, this is an ending today. It's not like it's done. This is something that's going to go on for a, a, an extensive period of time in terms of changes, and it's something we should be super proud of, but also super ambitious about. Um, let me talk for one second before we get to questions about what's needed, because I hear a lot about the three things we need, which is technology, policy, and finance, that that's what, it, what we need in order to really change the energy system in this country. And of course, all of them are true. And the United States is perfectly capable on all of them. But th the question is, why are we not getting those three things? And in my mind, policy actually leads technology and finance. I mean, the easy one of those to talk about in Santa Barbara is finance. Because when you talk about energy finance in the United States now, people talk about basically getting beyond where there's enough money to a place where the risk is too high and the people are unwilling to invest. And financial people in, and in sort of progressive energy feel that this is a big structural problem. But as somebody who spent 30 years in finance, I think that is a misanalysis. Because from my point of view, there's way more money in the United States than is needed to solve this problem. The issue we have is this is a very different model from information technology, which is how all venture capitalists think about things. Information technology is infinitely replicable. Software is infinitely replicable. So you have to put in relatively small amounts of money and if it works, you get a gigantic payoff. Most energy systems you actually have to touch. They're physical. They're not infinitely replicable. And the systems take a lot more money. And so as a result, the model of payoffs is completely different and has to be completely different. So if you think about it, <laughs> I'm not sure you guys came here for a finance lecture. I'll try and do this quickly. If you think about a venture portfolio, the traditional way to think about it is, if you have 10 investments, you want two of them to pay for the whole portfolio, four of them to be kind of okay, and the rest of them are zeros, and that works. But when you're doing an energy 
portfolio with a lot bigger investments, you really can't afford to have those gigantic losers, and you probably won't have those gigantic winners. So what you need is a much higher probability win with a lower payoff. And what that means is you need revenues when you start. You actually have to have contracts, and as a result, when people s say you get to a certain size and people don't want to invest, they don't want to invest unless they have locked in revenues. There's a ton of money in the United States. Interest rates are really low. It's not that the hurdles are too high. It's the way this is structured in right now, and particularly if you're selling into a utility model, which is really slow, it's very scary for people to put up that kind of money. To me, that's a policy question, because the w if, w if we get assured revenues, the money will be there without any question in my mind. And I feel the same way about technology. I know we have to, this is a huge business already. It's growing twice as fast as the American economy. We have more solar jobs than combined natural gas and coal jobs in the United States already. This business is growing fine. It will continue to grow fine. But for us to take it into a place where we start to accomplish the goals that we need, we actually need policy to change. We don't need policy to change for us to do fine. We need policy to change for us to have a revolution. And the example I will use is IT. Because between 1983, when we broke up Ma Bell, and 94 to 96, when we deregulated communications, we went through a complete revolution in terms of what happened. We had very good government investment, which is important from a research standpoint, because American business doesn't make huge 20-year investments with uncertain payoffs to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. But we also had a deregulated environment where people could innovate to their heart's content, and in fact have and have come up with a system that absolutely not only didn't exist, but no one had thought of 30 years ago. So when we think about what's going to happen in energy, the answer is we don't know. It's going to be way better and way faster and way cleaner and more successful than anyone in this room can imagine. And every time it happens two years later, we're going to be like, of course there's an internet. Of course there's a Google. Of course there's a Facebook. You know, you just start to think that was always written in the cards, but it wasn't. It was preceded by very good policy. So the we looked at this. We looked at energy. And the Skoll Foundation does a map. And they basically break it down into science, policy, and politics. And they have every organization that they know of, and they put it on the map. And the size of the circle representing an organization is the size of its budget how much they spend every year. Ton of good science organizations. A large number of exceptionally good and well-financed policy organizations. No politics. So the fact of the matter is, they did the work to say, where are there no organizations dealing with this? And the answer was politics. There really was, and if you think back in energy policy, there was no one pushing politically, so we thought, it's possible that that would be a place where we could make a difference and where, in fact, the problem was, because I see this as a political failure. I see this as an education, uh, really an education of America issue. Because if you look, and it isn't even what, you thi what, what you'd normally think, the polling is two-thirds of Americans basically, at some level, agree with what I just said. It's just that in politics, polling is not actually what matters. When you read the papers and you read about polls, people think that's what determines policy outcomes. But it isn't. What determines policy outcomes is votes. And what determines votes is importance and urgency, salience. So for instance, I'll give you an example. The, the example I like to use is gun control. 92% of Americans wanted background checks on guns last year. We did not get background checks on guns. That's with 70% of NRA members wanted background checks on guns. And we did not get background checks on guns. So if you think that polls are what drive American politics, that makes no sense. But if you think that salience and votes are what drive American politics, which is what I think, then it all, it's very easy to understand what happened. Because the people who really, really don't want any gun control, that's their one issue. 
that's the only thing they vote on. And the 92%, that's an issue, but it's not one of the top five. They're not gonna change their vote based on gun control. And unless you're willing to change your vote, your opinion doesn't actually have any oomph for an elected official. They will try and do the right thing. I'm not trying to be too cynical. It's not as if I think that elected officials don't have you know, decency and ethics, but the thing that drives them professionally and politically is votes, and they wanna feel like they're pleasing the constituents to the extent that they're gonna change their votes. And so when you think about energy and climate, people agree with us, but they don't care. If you listed it in terms of what is your priority, ahead of it would be jobs and health and education. And that's why we haven't gotten the policy through, not because people don't agree, but because the people care more on the other side than on our side. And so when you think about what has to change, what has to change is votes. What has to change is how much people care. They have to think that this is something that is important and that they have to change about. It. So that's actually the way that we think about it. We think that, you know, we have to go into elections not only to figure out how to win those elections, but make the elections strategically count so that we get to a place where the policy changes. So let me, the last thing I'll say is this. People think that we're having a terrible time politically in the United States. You know, if you read the paper, you would think that we had hit a level of dysfunction that was historic and kind of shocking. And there is some truth to that. But there's not 100% truth to that because the Congress of the United States is not the only elective body. It's not the only important body in the country. That's just to how it's covered in the press. So if you think about what's happened in California since we have a federal system, not only do we have great energy legislation, but we're trying to hook up with Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia to create a carbon market. There are nine states on the East Coast who have a carbon market and where there are other states where we believe that they will join that. It's called REGI, the, re the Regional Greenhouse Gas Association. So the fact of the matter is, DC on a congressional level kind of is frozen. I mean, if you look statistically or any other way, you'd see that they find it very difficult to do things. But there are other parts of the system, and I think our administration has actually done a very good job over the last year on energy and climate. It, they are not looking at it politically. If you saw what they released today, if you see what they're gonna release in June, if you listen to what they say and how they're treating it, they're treating it as a legacy issue where they have absolute you know, need to do the right thing and not to put it in a political context, which is a change. But it's also true that the United States government is not the disaster that it's portrayed in, in the press. And let me say this, if you'll remember as Californians, I, I always, when I am not in California, I'm obviously a proud Californian. I love California. But I don't wanna be too snotty when I'm not in California because I think people are <laughs> jealous of us. So I try and pretend I'm a little more humble about it than I really am. And I always say, California, we like to lead. We went bankrupt before the United States went bankrupt. <laughs> we couldn't pay our, you know, our civil servants before the United States couldn't pay its civil servants and we had less than a 15% approval rating for our legislature before you guys, so we like to lead. And hopefully that relaxes them a little about me, but the fact of the matter is we're also coming out of it. And so the United States is gonna come out of this too. And there are two ways we're gonna come out of it. People are either gonna loosen up on the partisanship and start to go back to our old model of ex you know, looking at the problem together and compromising on the solutions or the composition of Congress is gonna change. And that's what's happened in California. We went from a place where everything I was joking about was true. We were dysfunctional, it cost us. I'm not saying it didn't cost us, it cost us a lot. You know, you look at what happened to our educational system while this was all going on. You know, it was expensive for California to have political dysfunction. It will be expensive, it is expensive right now for the United States to have political dysfunction in Congress. But it will not be forever. The, you know, what the things that I believe in in this, one is I believe the, the private sector will solve this, ultimately when they get the, the framework right. Two, I believe in democracy. 317 million Americans, 37 million Californians are much smarter than we give them credit for. 
we, you know, people pay attention much more than they get credit for. They think much more than they get credit for. So it, you can't, a dysfunctional system where the people get a right to throw the bums out does eventually happen. It happened here. It will happen nationally too. And the question is, how fast will it happen and how expensive it will it be for us before that really happens? And the third thing I believe in is full cost accounting. Because when you think about this system, as a business person, I don't know what the right outcome is. At some level, I don't care what the right outcome is. What I want is for people to pay for their pollution fully and let businesses figure out the best way to deliver a commodity energy to all of us. You guys do not know what the source of your energy is when you get up in the morning and turn on the bathroom light. You have no idea, you have no ability to make that decision. Really, this is a system-wide issue where basically the system has to be set up right so that those decisions, when businesses make them, include all of the costs so they maximize the right thing. That is actually what it w the way we'll optimize the best decision. If you don't include costs, then we will get the wrong answer. And the, the example I like to use is, if I have a garbage disposal company and I just take the garbage and put it in my brother's yard, which I would like to do and would not feel bad about, <laughs> but if I did, and if you knew my brother, you would agree, but <laughs> if you do that, I can have a really profitable business, but it makes no sense. And that's what's going on now. I should have to pay for taking the garbage and sticking it in his yard at some level. And when that happens, then I can compete with all the other garbage disposal companies. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of energy. As soon as I'm fully paying for my cost, I don't know if it's gonna be the hydrogen car, which someone was touting me on today. I don't know if it's gonna be flexible solar panels that you can paint on and that are incredibly cheap. You can put them on your window. Someone was telling me about that last Thursday. There are so many incredibly cool great ideas, many of them at UCSB, from people, and a lot of them are gonna work and some of them aren't gonna work for reasons we haven't figured out yet. Maybe the flexible paint, you know, when it hits by water will wash away and be unusable. We don't know, but the fact of the matter is once the framework is right, then we can let people innovate, then we can let people take their science, apply it, and try and turn it into big businesses. And that's actually how it's worked. So we, you know, I have been running my mouth for a while and trying to talk to people about how to think about energy from the perspective of both how to do it right and how to do it in a way that we will be incredibly proud of ourselves when we're through. And let me say this, you know, when I was growing up in, uh, in New York, so I was growing up in New York and it was in the 60s and the best athletic team in the country was, as far as I was concerned, was the New York Yankees. And they were always, I know it's terrible. <laughs> I agree. And uh, the best player was uh, Mickey Mantle, and he was uh, a guy from Oklahoma who was basically a fall down drunk. And no one in the Mantle family had ever made it to 40 years old because they were coal miners in Oklahoma. And so they were all, all the men would go into the mines and breathe the coal dust and they'd die at like 38. So Mickey Mantle, you know, he figured he was gonna die, he might as well get drunk at breakfast. And he did. And when he was 54 years old, because you don't breathe coal dust in center field at Yankee Stadium, he said, if I'd known I was gonna live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> he was not a genius, but he was a great baseball player. But my point is this, and it refers to both the older people like me here and the younger people here, which is we should take ourselves seriously. We should take our responsibility seriously. You know, we get, we are like Mickey Mantle in the sense that we have a great opportunity in my mind here to have a huge difference that we can think of ourselves doing something important. And for the young people, let me say this. The old people here actually really care about what they're doing. You may not, I didn't believe it when I was in school. I figured the old people were trying to do as little work as possible and have as nice as life as possible, but it's actually not true. 
the, the people take it really seriously. They really want to do things that they feel proud about. And I have four kids between the ages of 20 and 26. And I know that they also are trying really hard to do things that they're going to be proud of and that they're going to look back at. And that is actually all we have to do, is we have to think that we have responsibility. I mean, we call our organization Next Gen Climate Action, Next Generation. All we have to do is remember, in the case of Mickey Mantle, that we could be the greatest baseball player in the world. Because that is our opportunity. And if we do that, and we move up what we're trying to do, so we say this is something that will define our generation, then we will succeed in it. And when we look back, we'll take it, we, you know, we'll be very proud. So I'll say one last thing, besides the fact that democracy is not a spectator sport. You know, this is famous. I would say two thirds of you probably have heard this, but Winston Churchill always said, Americans always do the right thing after they try everything else. <laughs> so we've tried virtually everything else at this point. So I think that it's time for us, honestly, to realize that we're going to do the right thing. I am absolutely confident we're going to do the right thing. And the sooner we do the right thing, the easier it's going to be to win, the less c costly it's going to be to win, and the happier we're going to be when it's over. So with that, thank you. That was great. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, and, and thank you for all of your questions. I have lots of cards here, and I think more <laughs> will be coming up. So I hope you've allocated at least till tomorrow morning to uh, address these. So uh, that was great. Um, you talked a lot about how California is leading and the great things going on in California. Um, but this is obviously a global problem. And for example, in the Wall Street Journal this morning, there was an article about the increase in exports of coal to Europe, I think. Saw that. Five times higher over just the last decade. So what should the US do to, to solve this very global problem? So obviously, this is a global problem. This is not like normal pollution. So if there's air pollution in Beijing, the people of Beijing may not be able to go outside. You know, their lives may be shortened, their kids may be sick, but it really isn't going to hit people in, use in Santa Barbara. But for carbon pollution, it's a worldwide issue. So there's no way that the United States can solve this by itself. Having said that, the, you know, some people call the United States the indispensable, indispensable country. There is no other, it's not like we're going to do it by ourselves. We're going to have to do this in conjunction with other countries, but they can't do it without us. So the reason that we're making such a public argument about this is we're going to have to go to China and have an agreement with them about how we're going to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. We're going to have to go to the EU and have a deal. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to do it publicly and we're going to have to do it from a position of, you know, I hate to say it, but moral authority. We're going to have to do the right thing first. So for instance, if we go to India, and say, we have a huge problem. You know, there's climate change. It's terrible, and we need you to help us. I know what they're going to say because they've already said it. They're going to say, we have a billion one people. We're very poor. We have not caused any of the emissions so far. You are much richer than us. You do multiples of the emissions that we do, and you're asking us to solve your problem. Are you kidding? And they're, and they're going to be and have been extremely angry that we would come to them with that request, given our history, our position, their history, their position. So in terms of getting it right, we actually have to get it right here and then use our technology, our money, our moral leadership to go around the world and get the different countries to come along with us. And if we don't do, if we don't, you know, the old, uh, expression, you have to walk the walk. If we don't walk the walk, we can't walk into those negotiations, we can't go into those negotiations and have any credibility. I mean, the fact of the matter is for India, what they're looking at as the result of climate change is horrific. Those billion one Indians 
are st staring at some really awful problems that, I, I mean, I could go into them with you, but you don't want to hear them. But trust me, the fact that they aren't responsible doesn't mean they're going to escape the problems. But for us to lead here, we have to be upfront. We have to deal with it internally so that we'll have the credibility around the world. And the next chance is going to be Paris 2015. So it's not that far off in terms of us having an opportunity to go and make agreements with different countries. So what do you think will be the outcome of Paris 2015? So the last two climate summits have been portrayed in the press, and I think by and large people think they did not go well at all. That's the nicest thing I can possibly say. And I think, therefore, there is a, a broad-based sentiment that the Paris summit is also going to be a failure and that it's impossible to get that many countries to agree to anything. So now let me give you a reason to be more optimistic than that. <laughs> I think what's going to happen in Paris is as opposed to trying to go and get 147 countries or 187 countries or whatever it is to agree to one thing, it's going to be much more bilateral. We're going to go to fewer countries and try and work out together, if you do this, we'll do this. I think that there's a much higher likelihood that we can succeed on that and then build from that with a handful of countries that are the major emitters. So. The real question it, from my point of view is, what kind of political base will the Obama administration be coming from? How credible will they be? And that, to me, is partially about their intentions, but also very largely about the politics of the United States, which is the other reason that we are pushing hard on this, because we want to give those guys as much, as strong a hand to play as possible, because I actually think they're you know, they understand this problem very clearly and try and do the right thing. You talk a lot about innovation, and we very much believe at the university in innovating to solve problems, particularly in energy efficiency. We're very proud of Suji Nakamura and the invention of gallium nitride, LE, white LE, LED, things like that. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of pullback from various venture companies that invested a lot in green energy and, and are pulling back lately. What, what is the solution to that? And, and you mentioned finance, but what can the financial community do to be more involved in capturing these opportunities? Well, I do think, I mean, I'm from, I live in San Francisco and I went to Stanford Business School and so I get a chance to be very close to a bunch of venture capitalists. And I do think that they were disappointed because they really did extrapolate from their experience with IT investing from a venture framework. This is a different size investment. It's a different kind of investment. And I honestly think they misjudge the nature of their clients. So let me give you an example. You know, when I I you're talking about energy efficiency. So let's say you go into a big utility and you say, you know, I have this unbelievably great energy efficiency idea that's going to reduce your revenues by 20%. I mean, that is, you know, they're going to understand that that's a good thing for society, but they're also going to understand that may not be the best thing for their company. So one of the big questions here is business model. I mean, I was talking earlier about portfolio construction, and there is a big question about portfolio construction and getting it right. But we basically have a business model of utilities that's over 100 years old. So Thomas Edison would really understand our generation model right now which is, you know, lines going to houses with gigantic power plants. You know, that's, and it's been around. What other business model have we had for 100 years that hasn't changed? So when we think about what can happen, when you think about energy efficiency, when you think about distributed generation, the idea that you can put solar on your roof, and, you know, uh, th how is the grid going to take that into account, and how are you going to get paid for what you generate versus the backup power that you need, the model's changing. But it's a politically driven model. So whereas in most of America, when things go wrong, the company goes bankrupt and you reorganize it or somebody else takes over and you disappear. Here, they have an absolute right to get a return on their investment and the model changes really slowly because it's controlled by you know, public utility commissions. So one of the things we've tried to do is to work state by state 
with this business group to try and reimagine re the utility of the 21st century because this model is not the one that's going to take us to where we have to go. And it's, it's silly to think that we can just throw it out the window because, by the way, everyone wants to turn their lights on tomorrow morning and everyone wants to use energy going forward. So we re it's really, it's going to be political whether we like it or not. You know, energy has been political. It's going to be political. And getting that right and getting the combination of policy and interest right is not trivial. It's complicated. There are a lot of questions on fracking in various forms here, but do you think the risks of shale and oil gas extraction by hydraulic fracking can be managed in an environmentally acceptable manner? Well, I think we don't know yet. I will say this. There are two, there are two things people use these advanced drilling techniques for, natural gas and oil. And I, I want to talk a little bit about Monterey shale because we're in Southern California and Monterey shale is a big question here. So let's, for, let's talk with the one that's straightforward. If you guys look at an energy generation pie chart, so it'll show in the United States, this isn't true for California, but it's true for the United States as a whole, how we generate our electricity. It's like 35 to 40% coal, 40% plus natural gas, 10% nuclear, and the rest is renewable. If you do the math, there ain't a lot left. And by the way, a lot of that is, is hydro. So when you think about how we actually generate our energy, what we think of is really important, which is the renewables, is growing really fast, but it's a small part. So when I think about the risks, it, 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 you know, what we've said in California that we want three things in terms of fracking. And I do really want to distinguish between natural gas and oil. And let me say one thing about Monterey Shale. We tried to look at Monterey Shale. We think the projections of what's available here, the prices at which it's available, and the number of jobs created are shockingly exaggerated. We, we think that the ability to be profitable here is marginal at best. We think the amount that's here is a fraction of what people are talking about. And we think the number of jobs is a fraction of a fraction. So when I think about what's going on here, what we've said is we want three things. We want absolutely safe regulation. We want people to pay for taking out oil and gas in a way that they do in every state but California. The California is the fourth biggest oil producing state. We're the only state of the top 20 that doesn't have an oil extraction fee. And we want local approval. So that if people in the local county don't want it, they don't have to have it. And if they do want it, they can have it, but only given that, it's at, that we have very tight regulation and that, that the people who are extracting it pay their fee. And that's the way that we've tried to balance what we see as, at least in natural gas, if you look at that pie chart, a, a, a real need to be able to get to a, a clean, renewable future. And what we see is the risks of fracking, which to a large extent, we don't know. You know, this is a technology that's been around for longer than people think, but where we've never seen it in the size it has huge, if you think about what's actually going on, it's very disruptive. It uses a ton of water. People are very, very nervous about what it's going to do because you're going right through the water table. So you're talking about doing it in a, here in a very populous part of the state. In North Dakota, you're doing it in the middle of nowhere. Here, you're doing it in one of the most densely populated parts of the United States. You're doing it in a place where there's a huge ag community where if, in fact, we disturb the water, this is something that's going to be incredibly impactful. Obviously, we have to be incredibly careful about this. So we're not even in a place here where we're, w I don't think we're in a place where we can really discuss this. In other parts of the United States, we are. There's several questions on the whole free market capitalism system. And do you think the free market system is capable of adequately dealing with climate change or is major government intervention needed? And if so, what form should it take? <laughs> well, here's what I would say. Yes to both. It seems contradictory, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we're at a very funny time in American history. There is a minority of the country that has decided that government itself is a problem. So that if government fails, that's actually good. That anything that you know, that obstructing government is good. There is no role 
I was reading an, an, a Wall Street Journal op-ed which basically said government is the opposite of freedom. And so if we take that view, you know, there is no role for government. From my point of view, government has an absolute role. And if you think about IT, its role was to set a level playing field and then let businesses figure out how to execute once the, le the playing field was level and fair. And that's always been, you know, we go right back to the 17th century or the 16th century in New England and that, you know, every first year economics student knows about the tragedy of the commons. If you don't charge people to put their cows on the common, everybody puts their cows on the common because it's free and soon there's no grass on the commons. The reason you have a government is so you have rules for things like that. And that's what we need. And when we've seen, I'd say again, when we've seen those rules put in place, Business is what executes the answer. So it, it's not as if we don't need a private sector, and it's not as if we don't need a government. We need both to serve their function, and they will. It, you know, I think that, that I'm confident in the private sector once the rules are right. But until the rules are right, they will optimize just the way they would if you could put your cows on the commons and, it w and the grass was free. You attract controversy. Here's I'll, I'll give you another shot here. Um, so <laughs> most scientists, some scientists I would say, feel the perceived danger of nuclear energy is greatly exaggerated, and nuclear energy could be a valuable bridge energy source. What is your view on nuclear energy? I have heard this, and there are about three new nuclear um, technologies that a lot of people are talking about. The basic thing I think about nuclear is it's not cheap. You know, because of the way that people feel about the dangers, you can't produce kilowatt hours at a competitive rate from nukes right now. And there is some, one of the new technologies is such low grade fuel that it can't be used for um, weapons. There's still a disposal problem. So when I look at nuclear, I get the point, there are no carbon dioxide emissions. I understand that that is a really good feature, but I have yet to see, and I, knew, I would love it if you could have a safe nuclear program with no carbon dioxide emissions that produced safe, abundant, cheap kilowatt hours, I think it'd be great, but we haven't seen it yet, and people are spending money on it, but right now, everybody who's talking about it cannot cite a plant and produce energy at a competitive price. It goes back to innovation. Uh, obviously, fusion produces much fewer, I if any, uh, byproducts than, than uh, fission does. There's a company in Southern California, Tri Alpha, which is doing you know, fusion of helium. Uh, Very familiar with it. Have followed it for at least five years. If it happens, it's a game changer. Would be awesome. I'm totally in favor of massive, safe, game-changing energy innovation. <laughs> And if we get it, but all I'm saying is, I don't, I view all of the, I don't view the outcome as something we can preordain. All I want to make sure is that the rules and the playing field are fair so that everybody can try their innovation and everyone can go up to the attic and their crazy Uncle George can see if he can come up with the thing that's going to work. Because someone's crazy Uncle George is going to, or maybe a thousand Uncle Georges are going to. And so, if, honestly, if Tri-Alpha works, it'd be fantastic. I mean, I know that's a game changer. And I know that, you know, right now, it seems to work theoretically in the lab. That's the stage show. Yeah, and they're not, about five microseconds is as long as they've got. Yes. Uh, yes, so. There's several questions about next gen. Um, a, a bunch about, are you hiring? And then uh, here's one, what is NextGen's plan to ensure that the next generation energy is stakeholder owned and recycles energy outlays back to the community? So, let me see if I can think about that for one sec. So the question in my mind on there is the question about the relationship between private enterprise and the communities or the individuals that it serves. And the question is, what is 
that relationship and is it a purely commercial one or are there broader um, requirements for being a you know fully acceptable company is that a fair restatement mm -hmm. so let me talk about that for one sec you know in the United States traditionally people thought they had a number of constituencies when they were running a company they thought you know they needed their to please their shareholders by making a bunch of money they thought they needed to have good relationships with their employees they felt like they were corporate citizens of their local community and that that was something that they were willing to spend time and money on and you know they had broader social ga goals for public companies that is not true anymore just so you know you know, in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s, there were a seri series of court cases in Delaware where most of the public companies are domiciled. And they went up to the Delaware Supreme Court, and the, the managements of the companies were arguing strenuously that they wanted to not maximize the profits for their shareholders because they wanted to do what was right either for the communities where they were located or the people who they worked with or who worked in the corporation. And the Delaware Supreme Court basically said in a series of cases, nope, you only have one constituency, hence your shareholders. And you don't have a right to take money and give it to the Pittsburgh Opera. Or you don't have a right to make payments to your employees that aren't because you, you think it's the right thing to do. Strange. So for public corporations at this point, that is the law for most of them. Now, having said that, obviously that, you, you know, we, my wife and I started a bank, if you can believe it, a community bank, and we have a triple bottom line. It's the largest community bank west of the Mississippi. And the triple bottom line is we have, we want to make money. We have to make money because we're FDIC insured. You actually put the equity into a foundation. So if we make money, we don't get to keep any of it. The money's gone, but we want to make money because it, the FDIC does not want to insure the deposits of a failing bank, of course. So we need to please them by making money. We want to be environmentally positive, and we want to have social justice coming out of it. So it means that we're making loans to people in poor neighborhoods or people who are trying to do progressive energy companies. So that's a triple bottom line. Let me say this. It ain't easy. And looking at how I believe that over time, people who have strong missions, people who are actually trying to accomplish something, do better economically as well as everything else. But the fact of the matter is in the United States, the relationship at this point between companies and their customers and the communities they work on are pretty circumscribed. And I, I don't think that's a good thing, but I think for a lot of managers, when they think about what they're hired to do, who's paying their salary, what their integrity is based on, and what their responsibilities are, it's more circumscribed than I would like. I'm getting a sign that we need to wrap up soon, so maybe for a last question. Um, do you perceive second and third generation biofuels as a viable long-term alternative and sustainable energy source as well as economically viable, both domestically and internationally? Also in relation to the inherent food severity issues they create. Okay, so let's put this in an American context, and it's something that I don't feel that I'm the smartest person in, I'm sure I'm not the smartest person in this room. I know just enough to be dangerous, but I'll explain the context of that question, and there, I'm sure there are people who could answer it better than I. Basically, the question is this. In the United States, the biggest biofuel by far is corn-based ethanol. And traditionally, environmentalists hated corn-based ethanol because they did not think that it saved energy, that it, they thought it took as much energy to create the energy as, you know, the competition. They thought there was a huge subsidy involved and that because the, the, the cost per BTU was a lot higher. And they thought that they were taking vast parts of our corn, you know, economy, basically in the Midwest, and using it to create fuel instead of food. So there was a whole bunch of reasons why people don't like it. Now let me put that in the context of 2014. Price of corn per bushel is down a lot. 
there is no subsidy really on a per BTU basis it's pretty damn equivalent at this point corn based ethanol if you talk to the peop the corn growers and the big ethanol producers which I have done they would claim that basically it saves 30 to 50 percent on an energy basis and the question there is how much I I is the question you ask which is when you take those acres out of production of food and put it into fuel what does it do to the food prices and the food availability around the world that's really th th what this is coming down to now let's be clear about what we're taking out of production what we're taking out of production is not food for human beings the corn that we're growing in the Midwest of the United States is overwhelmingly corn that humans cannot eat it's being fed to animals so what we're really talking about is corn that's being used as feed for you know dairy cows beef cows pigs as opposed to the sweet every time you, you hear about a bushel of corn you probably think about corn on the cob and butter and salt it's not that I don't know the right answer I th I think that we are definitely look and I've talked to a bunch of environmentalists to try and get their take I can tell you I think the way that we've looked at it is out of date it, for sure about the subsidy part of this and there's a real question about um, you know how we'd use the land one of the th it's it's a complicated question because of this you know the food situation in the United States is also imperfect and thinking about how we use our land in food production and what we what we grow and how we grow it and how healthy that is for Americans is also a very complicated question so I started by saying I'm not the person who has the perfect answer on this I've thought about it a lot I've tried to talk to the people on both sides of this issue who are most knowledgeable and I'm not exactly sure how to come down on it honestly the one thing I did talk to these guys and they were I in in Iowa and they were talking to me about uh, cellulosic ethanol which means taking the stalks and the you know grinding them up and using that and I s and they said this stuff is just great just great and I said well what does it cost per gallon of gas you know on a BTU equivalency 15 bucks <laughs> I was like 15 is higher than four <laughs> I'm sorry they're like no this is great <laughs> I was like, so one of the things that's really true here is what we're gonna do there is the scientific ability to do it and then there's the market test of can we produce this commodity energy at a price where it's going to allow us to continue to go forward and I think a lot of people think we can't do both but we can and the fact of the matter is when we give our a market test is not a bad thing Havi having to be able to do things where we include all the costs and basically say to ourselves this is what you're allowed to produce in terms of uh, CO2 emissions that is the rule under which we can work and we then maximize given that rule and that is what American society can do really well we just have to face up to the need to include all of our costs and then when we do all, all these individual questions will be competed against each other to deliver what we want to have and that's why I'm you know that is the framework for us to succeed in this and we really need the political will to make those decisions and for that let me say this to the people in this room democracy isn't a spectator sport this doesn't happen unless Americans do the things that they've traditionally done when there's been a big need which is to vote to register to talk to each other and to push and if we don't do that it definitely won't happen because there are people on the other side who it is absolutely in their interest for nothing to change and so I, I talked to a guy who runs a huge energy company and he talked to me about that big pie chart and he said how much do you think it's going to change over the next 30 years and I said you know I gave him my opinion and he said I don't think it's going to change at all we're going to be using the same percentage of coal the same percentage of natural gas the same percentage of everything and he said that's great doesn't change at all we're completely screwed so congratulations you have an opinion but that is actually what we need to do is to push to make the change and if we it's not going to be someone else doing it 
unfortunately, it will have to be people like the people in this room and specifically the people in this room. Because if we don't push, it is not going to happen. And that's actually why I quit my job, to push and to try and be one of the pains in the ass. <laughs> well, I have to commend you. I think it, it is absolutely true that this is probably the most important issue facing the world today. And, and, and so devoting your efforts and Next Gen's efforts to solving it is, is hugely important. So um, I hope you'll all join us outside for reception. And uh, thank Tom again for all of his insights. Thank and you.